Welcome to Generations, everyone. I'm so excited that you guys are here. We're kicking off this Christmas season with a bang because we are joyous. We are thankful that our Savior is being born this month. So we're celebrating this month. Sing with us.
you're up and up. So check out the screens. Hi Generations, my name is My Grace and I've got this week's Up and Up for you. Christmas at Generations is less than a month away. Between our two campuses, we have 11 services to offer. After all, Jesus is the reason for the season and it's our job to make sure you have the opportunity to worship, spend time in prayer, and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. This year, our service will be filled with your favorite carols, a special take-home element for the kids, and a candlelight finale centering ourselves on the light of the world, Jesus. Check out times and locations on the website now and make a plan to meet your family here. What do pancakes, Santa, and generations have in common? The Extreme Christmas All-You-Can-Eat Pancake Breakfast, of course. Our children's ministry team has worked hard on getting this event ready for you this year. Bring the family on Saturday, December 9th, anytime between 9 a.m. and noon, and stay for photos with Santa. The event is free, and it is sure to be a great start to your day. And that's not all we have in store in preparation for Christmas. The giving tree is up in the gathering now. Take a tag, follow the instructions, and return it with your gift by December 10th. Your gift for this one person could change their Christmas into one to remember and one to truly be thankful for. And last, but certainly not least, if you are new to GCC, we want to welcome you. As our guests, we have something special just for you. We call it Generations in Five. At Generations in Five, we will share with you who we are, what we believe, and why we do what we do. This only lasts five minutes, and we have a special gift for you as our thanks for choosing to spend part of your weekend here with us. So after the service, stop by in front of the stage, and we look forward to meeting you. That's all I've got time for, but that's not all that's happening here at Generations. Check out our app or our website for more information on these and many other events coming up. Now let's get back to our service. In Psalm 68, um, Psalm, sorry, Psalm 62, 8, it says, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. He's the only one worthy of our trust. So let's give Him our praise. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, He is my song. You are
me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down That is proclaiming that he is good and he is in his life and he is his savior. So we're gonna have a baptism right now. You guys can have a seat and I'm so excited to hear his story. Good morning, church. With me, we have Danny Hemp and I have really enjoyed the conversations I have had with Danny about how Jesus has just become very real and very personal. Went through a couple of difficult times, but Jesus proved to be bigger than those difficult times. And I know there's a couple of things that you, you want this church family to know about your Savior and why you're getting baptized today. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. Forgive me, I've been a mess all morning. That's a good mess, Danny. <laughs> I'm just thankful to have Christian brothers and sisters around me to, to guide me. And uh, I've walked a path that wasn't so great for a long time because I was the king of my own world. And uh, I just gave it to God. And he's, uh, he's shown me the light. How excited are you to follow and, and follow Jesus' um, command to be baptized and modeled it? How, how does that make you feel here this morning? So excited. I can't even sleep. <laughs> well, I know in this pool with me is Bill Bunting, who's kind of walked this journey with you. So, Bill? Well, I've known Danny for about five years. We first met in Rotary, and you know, for the very first time I ever met you, uh, I knew you were a young guy seeking something. And I'm just really pleased today that you found everything you need in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and I also am proud of you for being obedient to his teaching and being baptized. Amen. Amen. So, Danny, let me ask you: Do you believe that Jesus Christ was the only Son of God and that He died for your sins? Yes, absolutely. Do you accept that him as your Lord and Savior today? Absolutely. With your profession of faith, Danny, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rise now. Say no more. What, a, what an incredible thing to see, man. I don't get sick of that. Uh, that, that can't happen, right? Uh, that's one of the things that we get experienced as we come together. And Jesus is praying this prayer, thinking about a guy like Danny when he institutes communion. In John chapter 17, he prays very specifically for those who would come to know. And so we want for this to be uh, just kind of 
the thing that postures us for the emblems that are being passed out right now. We're passing out the grape juice and bread that is representative of Christ's flesh and blood that is sacrificed for us so that Danny can be part of the unity that we all experience together with Jesus and the Father. So would you listen today to John? Chapter 17, verse 20, as Jesus prays, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them my glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation get the the cup in your hand and the bread. You can take it when you're ready. As one body in unity right now, let's remember what he did for us. If you're a member of the body of Christ and you follow Jesus, you're invited to this meal. Let's remember him. Verse 25, Jesus concludes this prayer, sitting around the table with these men. He says this, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I've made it known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself May be in them. We acknowledge today that you are in us. Your spirit is in us. And we have unity with the Father Jesus through your completed and perfect work. We cannot comprehend it because we know our sin. But yet we we believe that you are fully righteous. So we thank you for covering us with your righteousness that we might have unity. It's because of that that we come today celebrating and worshiping.
through our fellowship, we're worshiping. Through our singing and praise, we're worshiping. And now, through giving, we are worshiping. And we're thanking you for the opportunity to do these things, Jesus. Amen. As our usher team is moving through the auditorium right now, uh, we get to have a chance to come and do that very thing, worship through giving as well. It's one of the things that we do weekly, and uh, we're blessed to get to do that. So if you're prepared to participate today uh, in community here with us, that's great. If you want to do so online or with our app, you can do that as well. We're launching a new series today, and Greg is going to do that. But uh, before that happens, there, there are times in our collective worship where now, you know, the band's bringing it, right? And it's where we're all on our tippy toes, like Mark was over here today on the bridge of that course. And like we're singing, you're never going to let go. This God is so good. Then there's times where we just need to be still, right? <laughs> Especially this time of year. We just need to like set and let the shalom, let the peace of God just kind of wash over us. And so we want to introduce a new song to you today that we're going to be singing during this Christmas season. And it just, it's from Isaiah and it talks about what a wonderful counselor he is. And so can you just kind of set and absorb it today? We're going to put the words on the screen. Just let your heart be still before the Lord as the band comes back. Come on guys.
Well, good morning, Generations. What's up? Everybody good? It's really good to have you here today. I mean, really, really, really good. We're excited to have this time in worship with you. If you are visiting with us for the first time, just the uh, next couple moments, uh, it's not going to mean anything to you. But for all of you who call this your church home, <clears throat> one of the commitments we made when we began a transition process of me to a younger man to take over the lead pastor position here is we made a commitment to keep you all aware of what's going on. And the initial plan <clears throat> was that we were going to team preach all the way up to about Easter of next year. I was going to do Christmas Eve. He was going to do Easter. You know, I've talked with a couple other lead pastors that have, have transitioned, and I've got some great advice. I spent some time in prayer. <clears throat> and so I, I, I asked Johnny and, and the team here, I said, look, I really believe that since I'm preaching here this weekend, this should be <clears throat> the last that, that I'm officially like in here and doing that and not just this transition going on and on and on. Johnny is the lead pastor now. I'm excited for him and for the church. <clears throat> and so this is going to be uh, the last time. And I do want to just take the moment to say, tell all of you how much you know, I have loved you. I have loved praying for you. I have loved the privilege uh, of being the pastor here. And <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I didn't mean for that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Please. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, I'm going to be doing a lot internationally. And like these other lead pastors said, look, mega church pastor, we know. We don't know missions like you do. You need to help us out here in the States as well. And I want to plug into our local community. So I have a lot to do. And I praise the Lord that I'll still have my home here. And this is my home church. And, and I love you all very much. And I want to thank you for it. It's about Jesus and just Jesus. So let's pray and get into his word. We got some great word today from the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the hope that we share in Jesus, all of us that are followers. And if there's any that are here that aren't sure where they believe or why, I'm glad they're here, Lord, because you want to help us understand just how how much you love all of us. And so, Lord, like everyone here, I need that, uh, it, the freedom from sin and have that in Jesus Christ as my Lord. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for other followers of Jesus as well here. And so, Lord, help us see Jesus and just Jesus in his word. And I pray this in his name. Amen. <clears throat> You know, whether you realize it or not, we are all storytellers. That's what we are. We like to tell stories. Uh, we like to talk about new things and exciting events in our lives or announcements. I, I remember my first car. You know, coming back from Ethiopia, I was in college for several years. I finally got my first car. It's 850 bucks. It was, a, it was called a Pontiac Executive, sort of like a Bonneville. And it was an old beat up thing, mostly rusting out. But man, I was so like happy. But I learned very, Really, really quickly, it was not a chick magnet, all right? But I, I, lo I love to talk about it, though, because I, I, I actually had a car. And then our daughter, you know, they were announcing the pregnancy in a very unique way. They're missionaries in Thailand. This is Chris and her husband, Preston. And so she put on Facebook, I tried to give up morning sickness for Lent, but apparently someone isn't going to let that happen. You know, when you have that first pregnancy and that first child, you like to share the news with others. Or it could be some of you, many of you have been now to Africa and we work in one of the largest slums of the world, most depressing places, and yet we see the power of God working there. And everyone that has been in this slum in Mathari, and we're sending two teams again this next year, everyone who's ever been there can't help but talk about it because it's made such an impression. We're storytellers, much like what we're going to see in the scripture today. <clears throat> there were shepherds in a field near the little village of Bethlehem. And we read in the scriptures, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. So they figure, OK, let's go see this for ourselves. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. 
when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Notice what happened here in this transition in their lives. In the space of a few short hours, they were just plain old shepherds in a field watching the flocks at night. When they had seen him, Jesus, they spread the word. Now these shepherds had a message and they had a mission to share it. They moved from just being shepherds to be messengers of the good news. Part of God's plan to be a world changer. It's just like all of us. We're storytellers. We like to talk about the first car, the pregnancy when we're married, the, the, the all exciting events in our life, the memorable times. But like these shepherds, we who are Christians, we have a message and we have a mission to get it out. It's really fitting that on my last really official time with you, this is what I share with you. The, Big part of the DNA we built into this church is our message, and we have a mission to get it out. In the Christmas story, that mission is really simple. It really comes down to this. Christmas is a story about going home. Let me set it up for you. We're in Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Okay? The entire world. Most powerful man in the world. Everyone, notice this, everyone without exception, then went to register himself, each to his own hometown. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David, because he was a descendant of David. Now let's just take a little pause here for a moment. Isn't it interesting that one man... One man can tell the entire world to go and be part of a census so he could tax them. One man was essentially saying, bring me money. And people did it. In fact, there's an ancient inscription that says Caesar Augustus is savior of the world. There's another one that says the birthday of the God Augustus has marked the beginning of good news for the world. He claimed this as part of his title as being a God, being good news for the world, savior of the world. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy stuff. I mean, by the way, any of you know when Caesar Augustus was born? <laughs> what was September 23? You missed it. I mean... <laughs> For such a powerful guy, why didn't you know? <laughs> Has anybody ever seen a Caesar Augustus card at Hallmark or any other place? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Yet, there was another birth in the time of his reign that is still being celebrated all over this world. And we're moving into that season as a church. But in that day... Think about it. In that day, Caesar himself and literally everyone else, they looked at his power. They looked at his fame. They looked at his influence. They looked at his money. And they assumed his legacy. The world would remember his birth. They assumed it. And Caesar makes this decree. And everyone we read complies. And Luke tells us because of that decree in a little town that he as Caesar would never visit, when a peasant man with a pregnant woman that he would never meet to his hometown. And it just so happens. Isn't it interesting in life how it just so happens that this hometown was the place where the, according to the ancient Jewish prophecies, over 300 of them, the Messiah the savior of the world would be born. So you have to wonder, look at the dichotomy, this man who everyone thinks will be, his legacy will be up there and held high forever. And Jesus Christ born in a very humble setting, a manger, 
laid it for his bed. You know, a stable and a manger. And look at the contrast. You have to ask yourself, who really is in charge of world events? Who's really making the decisions of what happens on this planet? I mean, we look at this lunatic in North Korea and we think, wow, we're edging close to war and it makes us nervous. We look at, at the ongoing crisis in the Middle East and we think, man, this is never going to end. It's not, by the way. And then we look at our own politics and the fighting in and out and you may be on one side or the other in between, whatever. And, and we look at all these people and think they have power. And God came to this earth to bring us home. So the actual town of Bethlehem, the word Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. And the one that was born there, who we worship and celebrate, would one day say, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry at the core of your soul, come to me. So Joseph goes home and takes his pregnant wife with him. You know, when we think of home, we tend to think of a place fixed. You know, when we started our mission career amongst the Maasai, that was home. Every time we were in Nairobi resupplying, talking about going home, it was two tents. <laughs> After 14 months of that, I hated camping. Trust me. <laughs> that was our sleeping tent. That was our living tent. We had two steps in, two steps out, and that was it. And the wind and the sun was blazing through that. 14 months, we called that home. And then we thought we really upgraded. We were in a 12 by 24 foot mud and waddle that we plastered with cement. No roof, no glass. We had to hand plane the wood and make shutter windows and doors. And he started off with dirt floor, eventually put a little cement down. But that was home. When we talked about going home, that was home. And it was like awesome because we had actual walls instead of you know, tents around us. And, and then we eventually built this 650 square foot, it's roofing tent house. And man, we thought we had arrived. It had two bedrooms. And by this time I had put a, a low pressure, on a low pressure spring, I had built a dam and the, the water was coming down by gravity. We had running water. We had a toilet, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let me tell you, next time you sit on one, thank God for it. <laughs> you live a few years without it, and you will thank God without it. <laughs> we had a toilet. Man, we were there, 650 square feet. And then we eventually moved to a training center that I developed for training Maasai leaders, both men and women. It cost us $17,000 to build this, this stone house, and that was home. Every time we talked about going home, that was it then. We look at a place and we tend to call it home. And home should be a place where love flourishes, a place where you belong and a place that's safe. And it's not that way for far too many people. And even in the best of homes, the longing that we have is way deeper than a physical address. You and I were made for a deeper home. And that's what Christmas is all about. Notice how Jesus says it. He says, I'll not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. A few verses down in John, he says, anyone who loves me will obey me, my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. That's the home that we were created for. Make no mistake about it. You were made to be in a place that God calls home. And God wants you to be at home in him. You were made for it. And he uses such endearing terms to try to help us understand this. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, eat with them, that person, and they with me. That enduring intimacy of sharing together, life together. And then he tells us this, uh, how the human family is invited into this home that God has for you. That's relationship with him. That's you in him and him in you. And he talks about how this prodigal son makes these terrible choices. And maybe you've made terrible choices. And maybe you're paying the consequences of those now or can remember paying consequences of them. 
But he says his son, he wounds the father. He wastes the money. He ends up destitute and in great pain. He says to himself, I got to go home. It's my only hope. I don't know if I'll be welcome. And little does he know, the father is looking every single day down the road for his son to come home. And when he does, he runs and throws his arms around him. And Jesus tells us that for a reason. That is God's heart for us to come home. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you have been, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that you understand that you are invited and you are wanted by God to come home. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. He's longing for you to be at home in him and him in you. And at this time of year when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, I mean, literally, the skies lit up that dark night and the glory of God shone. Do not be afraid, the angel told him. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. A Savior to bring us home into relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. This is children. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to be a storyteller and spread the good news. You know, it's highly significant in the scriptures that the very first people to see the baby Jesus and spread word about him were shepherds. That's highly significant. Because there were certain occupations in that culture in that day that literally the translation would be they were called despised occupations. One of them would be gamblers, prostitutes, those who oppressed the poor, Sabbath violating people, farmers tended to do that a lot, and shepherds. Despised occupations. So <clears throat> shepherds typically took care of the rich people's sheep. They'd steal one here and there and slaughter it and eat it and say a wild animal had, had killed it or they would sell it and say, oh, I got lost or whatever. So they were considered untrustworthy and unworthy of being uh, counted as much. So they had very low status in, in, in culture. So much so that in that culture, in that day, shepherds couldn't testify in a court of law. In other words, if somebody had put a, a case against you or they, 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 they accused you of a crime and your only witness was, hey, I was playing cards with these three shepherds, you're toast. You're Christy Critter. Sorry. <laughs> they couldn't testify for you. They couldn't. <laughs> you, you had no, no witnesses. Yet it was shepherds that God chose to be the very first people to witness and tell about the birth of Jesus. Why? Here's the importance of it. It's very important. If shepherds, as lowly as they were, could be witnesses for Jesus Christ, that means anybody can be a witness of Jesus Christ. It's not about eloquence. It's not about position. It's not about power. It's not about money. It's about the life-changing good news of Jesus Christ. You know, some in social media, you know, I'm involved in it quite a bit, and you know, I see some fantastic photos and you see some unbelievable selfies and uh, you see these outrageous claims and you see people fighting back and forth and you read it and, and you see meaningful life experiences. You get all of this being played out on social media. Why is it that we who are Christians don't share about what matters the very most in the entire world? The one thing that has eternal consequences to it. We're not storytellers of the good news. Why is that? Notice what the angel said again. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Good news. This is, we have good news if we're Christians. And here's the key to good news, you know. Jesus made it very clear. It wasn't for just the powerful. Caesar can make a decree. Everyone has to obey. And we look at that kind of power. We go, Wow. And then, you know, it's not just for the rich either. I mean, uh, Warren Buffett can just make a statement and it'll sway the markets. And we go, wow. Or it's not just those who have influence over us, like Oprah. You know, she bought 
10% of Weight Watchers and their stock went up 105% immediately. And we look at that kind of influence and we go, wow. But notice what Jesus said. I bring you, the angel said to him, good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The emphasis that God was giving through the angel was simply this. All people from the lowliest untrustworthy shepherds to the most powerful kings and emperors on the planet. All the people. Because Jesus is good news and can bring great joy to the longing in your heart and life. You who do not feel you're loved, you do not feel worthy of love, you who feel like you're unattractive or unwanted, you may be blown through a marriage, maybe two, maybe even three. You who have this hurt, or you're feeling lonely, or perhaps stressed out at school, or left out at school, or you may have been scarred by abuse, whether it be physical, or emotional, or even worse, sexual. Jesus Christ is good news, and only Jesus died on a cross. Only Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Only Jesus can forgive your sin. Only Jesus can answer your prayers. Only Jesus can bring you purpose and meaning in your life. Only Jesus can bring hope to you, hope beyond this life and into the next. And only Jesus can make his home in your heart. And only Jesus, the one who was born in a manger, died on a cross, rose on the third day, is still today. 2,000 years later, reaching the far corners of this world and changing lives. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. Notice what it says. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. Notice that. All who heard. Now, of all people that come up with a reason why they can't talk to others, untrustworthy shepherds, but they did. And all who heard were astonished. See, if you have found a home in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, don't lose the passion of what God has done for you. And the to-do for you is as simple as invite somebody here. Invite them to church with you. The music and the team work so hard to prepare the music for that service. Everybody who serves in this place makes it. They work so hard to make this an inviting place because people get beat up out there, and we want them to know they belong here and that they're loved here and that they're safe here. It could be as easy as inviting somebody to Christmas service. It's going to be a very reflective, family-friendly service. I mean, it's going to end with candlelight singing. It's going to be awesome. You know, I, I, I'm really proud of my daughter, Jocelyn, and, and, and her husband, Ed, in, in Myrtle Beach, because they constantly, they're inviting their friends that they meet just to come to church and check it out with them. And they've got a whole bunch of people going to church just through an invite. We have about 1.5 million people who are within 15 minutes drive of our two campuses. You have neighbors, you have friends, you have coworkers, you have fellow students, you have all kinds of people around you that need Jesus. All kinds of people. 91% are not evangelical Christian. People listen to those lowly shepherds, even though they were considered low, low class. You know why? Two things. One, they were excited. They couldn't help not talk. They had to. They were so excited. Second reason, God inspires the words. God will inspire your words. Even the most shy, introverted, the most humble, the most unlikely of you, God will bless your words. Just to, as simple as inviting somebody here or telling somebody why you love Jesus. See, if people listen to the shepherds, how much more are they going to be more likely, your friends to be more likely to listen to you? You're one of a kind. You're part of God's plan to reach another person. God has many, many more that he wants to bring home. And you're a part of his strategy. There's somebody in your life that God wants to reach through you. Now, maybe you're not a Christian. You're not sure where you stand or bounced in and out of church. Here's the, here's the cool thing about it. You need to understand, leave this place knowing that God wants you at home in him and he in you. 
Home is a place, as I said, where love should flourish, where you should be safe, and where you're supposed to belong. And in Jesus Christ, you have that. It's unwavering. It's unwavering. God wants you to be at home in him and him in you. See, this Jesus whose birth we celebrate in this season came to earth fully human, the most humble way that God, the creator God, can enter into this planet through the birth canal of a woman just like all of us. That made him fully human yet fully divine without sin, lived that perfect life so he was that perfect one to be that sacrifice to pay for human sin. So God's justice remains and God's love reigns, and it met at the cross with him dying. So here's what's so cool about that. We are then free and forgiven from our sin. And you know something? If you have been out there not sure where you're on this, you could be like the shepherds this very day. They started their day not knowing Jesus. They finished their day praising God and celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And that could be your story today. Father, thank you so much for your word. <clears throat> it just helps us realize how much you want us home with you and you at home in us. And Lord, if there's anyone questioning that or wondering where it is or that where they are in this whole process and their spiritual formation, please give them, Lord. The, the courage to step into <clears throat> one of the care rooms, whether in Spring Hill or across the gathering or lobby here, and ask any question that they have and that they would leave this place knowing just how much you love them and how much you want to be at home in them and the, them at home in you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about as a church for a few weeks now, uh, just having some intentional time uh, for us to honor Jesus by honoring some folks that have been serving us so well for 15 years here. And you know, Greg and I, we've talked about this, what's more difficult than uh, doing something like this once is doing it four times on a weekend, right? right? But it's, it's good for our hearts uh, just to reflect on, and what, is, what has God been doing and what has he done through uh, the service, I mean, we've been served. This church has been served by Greg and Becky Johnson. And so to put all that together in uh, a video, it's literally impossible. It can't be done, okay? But we tried, okay? <laughs> so moments that uh, we can laugh at uh, because of just the uniqueness of who they are and how God made them wonderful and also uh, just some pictures that remind us of how he served through them. So would you check this out?
Welcome, Generations uh, Christian Church. Would, would uh, you welcome to the stage uh, Greg and Becky Johnson? We have uh, man, our, our, our current serving elder team, and uh, also we've asked all the elders who've served with uh, Greg and Becky in their time uh, here to come and be a part of uh, the different services over this weekend. And uh, we're, we're trying to look for all kinds of ways to express the love of this church for you guys. And one of the things, we want you to be able to know what time it is in the world anywhere, okay? And you can do that by turning the dial on this thing. And uh, we don't know what else to say other than this, Pastor Greg and Becky Johnson. Thank you for serving us as a body. John. I don't know. When you give a clock to a retired person, what does it mean? <laughs> you ain't retired, buddy. Well, the story of the Bible is the story of God raising up men and women who would seek his face, hear his voice, and follow him wherever God directed them in seeking and saving the lost. So it was that Becky's home in Orlando wasn't her real home. God led her to Milligan College and on the mission field with his parents, Greg's home was not in Ethiopia. God led him to Milligan College where God put the two of them together and showed them the next step in their journey, which was to go to the African bush and minister with the, uh, what's the? Maasai. The Maasai. <laughs> I keep saying Malawi, that's another country. <laughs> All right. And then eventually God led them to come here and serve us at Generations. For that we're so thankful and I've been uh, an elder just most of the time that Greg has been here. Now along the way, we had to make a few corrections. We've had to help Greg understand that we are fishers of men. We don't chase people through the woods with a spear. <laughs> that might work, I don't know. And also we don't baptize people by throwing a ball at a target and having them fall in a tank. But other than that, it's been great. And we're so thankful that we've had the privilege to, to serve with them. Becky is one of the leaders of our missions team, and Greg, as he has led the staff and worked with the elders in bringing this church to this location from our previous location on Keystone. 2009, we've been here on this campus. And the church has continued to thrive and to grow because of his vision. So now what? Another crossroad. Where is God going to lead them? Well, that's the question they have uppermost in their mind. But they're secure in knowing that wherever God leads them, as they devote themselves and commit themselves to his purpose, much fruit will be born in their lives. We're so thankful that we have had them with us for these years. And thankful as we go through this transition to Johnny's leadership that we will always remember how we got here by walking in faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful for Greg and Becky and the witness and the leadership that they have given us as this church. We're thankful, Father, that at this time in their lives, they are now able to seek whatever else that you may have in store for them and put their energies to work for your kingdom. And Father, we pray that as a church, loving them and always devoting our, ourselves to whatever we can do to help them in their future ventures, that you will guide us and help us as we continue to grow here in Christ, grow in maturity as well as in numbers as you bless us in this ministry. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
I want to ask you to have a seat just for one moment longer. Uh, we want to give Greg and Becky a chance to get to the lobby before uh, you, are, you are unleashed to mob them with affection. Okay, that's your job today. Uh, so I want to give them, a, give them a chance to get out there. And uh, Joe and I circle up with Greg this week. We were at Starbucks. And Greg just, we were talking, you know, when you're around Greg, what he preached today, it's on the top of his heart. And so that flows out. And so that was, we were at Starbucks and it was flowing out. Okay. And he walked right into like a six minute TED talk uh, about something I'd never thought about before in missions. And Joe and I kind of talked and I'm like, Greg, that was amazing. I'm never going to forget it. It was just this little teaching nugget. And we said, we, you probably got 20 of those, right? Greg's like, oh yeah, he does. Okay. Cause no one's, there's not many people that have done what he's done in the mission field and then come back and uh, had such an incredible ministry in the States. And so uh, we, we brainstormed for a while about getting together and doing some videos and putting these together uh, for him to show what he can do with missions groups around the country. God has got some incredible things uh, in store, and we're excited to be walking in partnership with Greg and Becky in the middle of that. And so what we've talked about as a body for the last two weeks leading up to this Sunday is this. What are some ways that we can tangibly um, show our love for them? Uh, we would wear them out if every one of us uh, stood in a line and said the things that were fitting for us to say to people that have served us, we'd compl- he wouldn't make it back to stage to preach next service, okay? Uh, so out in the lobby, when you walked in, maybe you noticed a group of tables that are set up. On that table, we have a bunch of note cards. We're asking that uh, if, if you don't have time to get to them today or the line's too long, don't leave without just jotting down some things that the Spirit would lay on your heart to encourage them uh, right now and the love on them. We want to bind together letters of love from this congregation and give them to them. And so would you participate in that way? And then another way is uh, the the church is loving them and helping launch them right now uh, financially uh, into this new ministry season. But we want to let you all in on that. Uh, They've got some trips planned already to Thailand. And who knows at what point he might have to leave Thailand and fly back uh, to take care of things back here. Uh, There's going to be flights all over from Thailand to looking to Vietnam and other places in Europe where he'll need to go. And so we want to arm them up with the funds to do so and want to let you be a part of that. So there are also boxes, all four corners, where you can contribute to a love offering to them today. And so you're released this week uh, to do that in the lobby to go and love on them. We love you. Thanks for being here today.